we're going to finish up the equilibrium uh, ester lab. Okay, so as far as your report goes, uh, it's one of the longer ones. You'll have a title, abstract, methods, and then results and calculations is what you're responsible for. Um, you can do all the other sections, but I just won't read them. Okay, so that's what you're what you need to turn in. To start off with, what things would we expect to show up in the title? Uh, let's get more specific. What things for this experiment? Let's pick some keywords that should show up. Equilibrium constant is a really big one, okay? Because that's the goal of the experiment. So we should see equal. I should see an equilibrium constant in your title. What else? Um, by a reaction, absolutely. The hydrolysis, I'm not too concerned about. Um, if you were going to write an introduction, I'd say, yeah, make sure the hydrolysis shows up in there, but I'm not too concerned about the hydrolysis, uh, hydrolysis part. I am much more concerned about seeing the reaction, the reaction of what? Ester. Okay, so looking at the reaction of an ester in the presence of water. Okay. Uh, Sorry, Does somebody have the procedure handy, printed procedure? I just flashed on something. Oh, it is a hydrolysis reaction. Okay, never mind. So, it is technically a hydrolysis, that just means we're reacting something with water. That's all that word means. Okay, what's that something? An ester. So what we're looking at is the breaking up if you want to get non-fancy with it, of an ester, and looking at that equilibrium constant. Is there anything else? Titration. We could look at titration. Um, titration's a little bit of an odd one. We are using that technique to determine this. Um, I probably wouldn't include it in it, though. There's another big key part of this. Is it just the ester hydrolysis. We just add water, ester, alcohol, and some carboxylic acid. What's that? We add hydrochloric acid. What was the role of the hydrochloric acid? Buffer. Not a buffer. Catalyst. It's a catalyst. Okay. So I would fully expect to see acid catalyzed reaction show up in your title. Okay. Because you are using an acid catalyst. In an introduction, you'd have to go through and explain that in a lot more depth, but that acid catalysis is really important to show up in your title. So those are all the key words that I would probably look for. Um, you should be able to put together a reasonable title from that. You would then go into your abstract, because your abstract is the next thing in the report. What would you start your abstract off with? Not the result. A clear stated goal. What was our goal for this experiment, or is the goal? To determine the equilibrium constant for the ester hydrolysis reaction that is acid catalyzed, blah, 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 blah. Okay? We could go through and do a brief sentence on why, or not sorry, not blah. I am sorry. Not why, but how. This is where you could mention that we are titrating against a standardized base to determine the acid concentration. Okay. Um, wouldn't be too stressed about seeing that sentence, but that's a good thing to show up. Okay. After that, you've now explained your goal, you've got uh, a how, and now you need the results. Okay. We don't need a why, whys are more introduction. Okay. So we need the result. What is the result in this case? Your what constant? Equilibrium. equilibrium constant. Okay? So you would then tell me what the equilibrium constant is. You will obtain four equilibrium constants from your four trials. Two, three, four, five. Who that was four? Okay? What should the equilibrium constant be in each of those four trials? The same. We would expect the exact same value. Okay? How would we show that in our results that we got the same value? 
could list every single one, but we can do it a little bit better than that. We get an average is a good call, but that actually then removes information. We don't see how similar all our values were. Standard deviation. Okay. So as far as your results go for this experiment, I do expect to see okay, your average K and a standard deviation. Because I don't remember how to do a standard deviation, not that it's that difficult, but I don't really feel like spending the time to look up how to figure it out. Um, what you can do is go into Excel, enter your trials, your trial equilibrium. So we could say we'll trial one, two, sorry, two, three, four, five, and those K values. We can then go off to the side and do equals average, that says average. Um, with our parentheses, we can click and drag and select all of those cells. To get the standard deviation, what can we do? Again, go into Excel equals STDEV. Again, with our parentheses, click and drag, and then we don't have to worry about any kind of goofy calculations. Ta da! Done for you. Yeah. To get the standard deviation? No. All right. Which brings up an interesting point when it comes to the results uh, and calculations section. I'm seeing a few people include lots of words and explanations. It's not a results and calculations section. The only sentences that should show up in your results and calculations would be your table titles and your figure captions. After that, any sequence of words that is not preceded by a number immediately in front of it is summarily, I think summarily, crossed out. Okay? Um, and it only gets frustrating. Okay? Don't frustrate me. I do not need to see explanations. One of the things that's nice about mathematics, you don't need to explain, you just follow the mathematics. If you've organized your calculations, you don't need to explain what's going on because I can see it. Okay? just to kind of clarify that issue. If you've got questions about it, you can always email me. Where that was the biggest issue, as you may have seen already, was the thermochemistry lab, and that's because the sample lab report that was posted to the course website was awful, as I said it multiple times, and it went through and explained all of the calculations. Do not do that. Okay? Um, after your results... In your abstract, what would you do? Very last thing I would expect, success. Okay? Was your result a success? Was it not? For this result or for this experiment, you don't have anything to compare back to. We don't have a literature value for the equilibrium constant. So how can you decide whether your experiment was a success? So you could go back and say how awesome you were as far as your skills. It might be nice to come up with a way to quantify it. Can we quantify your success? It's a little bit trickier. Standard deviation. We ran a standard deviation. If your standard deviation is small, what does that mean? All four of your trials came out to the exact same equilibrium constant, which, since it's a constant, they should. If they came out dramatically different, the first thing I'm going to assume is not that you did the experiment wrong, but that you did your calculations wrong. Okay? So if your equilibrium constants come out all sorts of wacky, you should probably talk to me and we'll go through and figure out what <coughs> we're doing. Okay? Um, if they're all the same, then hey, good job. That would be a nice way to measure your success. Okay? Questions about that? Okay. So, in general, our introduction, why do we go through and do determine equilibrium constants? Gives us an idea of the feasibility of the reaction. If we were going to move into an organic chemistry class, there are experiments or experimental designs where we would run multiple of the same type of reactions. So we'd do several ester hydrolysis reactions. Okay? And what we would do is say what changed in each of those ester hydrolyses. The mechanism would ultimately be the same, why does one reaction favor products more than the other? So that would be something we would want to evaluate and determine, and we could draw parallels back to structural effects. Okay? 
Um, so it's one of the reasons why we're going to go through and do it. Ultimately, why are you doing it? Because it's similar to what you're doing in lecture. Okay? So it kind of parallels that material. Um, what we would expect to see in the introduction, which you don't have to write, a balanced overall reaction should talk about the acid catalyst. Because okay? all of those are really important in our very initial statement of why and what we're doing. Okay? The next issue is how do we end up doing it? What we're going to do is titrate uh, each of your equilibrium mixtures against a known base. What will that base react with? It will absolutely react with HCl. That is a very good point to bring up, and it's going to be one of the uh, more irritating issues with this experiment. But does that give us any information about our equilibrium constant? What is our equilibrium constant going to be if we try and solve for it? K equals our carboxylic acid times the alcohol divided by our ester times water. Anywhere in that equilibrium constant expression, do you see HCl? No. So yes, adding base does react with HCl. Good call. Completely useless as far as determining our equilibrium constant. What else does that base react with? The carboxylic acid that's present. Okay. So what we're going to do is titrate our solutions and since we didn't add any carboxylic acid there, what we can do is compare how much acid we put in. The base will react with that acid, the HCl, but then it's going to continue to react with the solution because we made some carboxylic acid in the process of doing our esterification, okay, or our ester reaction. We can then determine the amount of carboxylic acid produced, our equilibrium concentration, and use that to back calculate the equilibrium concentrations of everything else in the solution. Okay? So what we're doing is using the titration ultimately determine the carboxylic acid concentration. Okay? So it allows us to determine the acid. We have to be careful when we say that. It's determining the carboxylic acid. And then we can ice table the rest of it. Okay? What are our complications? Well, First off, which we've already seen, we need to be able to standardize the base. We need to know the exact molarity of it. We're going to go through, officially day one today, standardize your base. It's all you're responsible for. Okay? So you'll go through and determine what the molarity is of your uh, NaOH solution that you're going to make. Okay? Um, we'll use KHP and phenylphthalein and all that fun stuff. The next issue that we've got to worry about is time. Okay? Why do we have to worry about time? No point do we measure or monitor time. Why is time an issue? So we could look at during the actual titrations. Uh, CO2 will react with water to make the solution acidic. In general, I don't think I've seen anybody take long enough to make that that big of an issue. There's a more important place where time is going to be in, come into play. Why did we not do this lab last week? Because the time to reach equilibrium is important. If we go through and start titrating your ester solutions now, they may not be at equilibrium. So officially, we have an extra day in there to make sure that your solutions get to equilibrium. Okay, so that when you do do the titration, you're getting accurate results. Okay? Um, so that's where time is going to be a problem. Next big issue is water is showing up in our equation, in our equilibrium expression. Okay? Water is an equilibrium, or typically not shown in our equilibrium expressions. Why not? Its concentration stays relatively constant. So we usually incorporate that into our equilibrium constant. Okay. In this case, water's concentration will change enough for us to care about a little bit. 
and it's super important as far as the overall reaction goes. In previous situations, water didn't actually or wasn't necessary for the reaction to occur. In this case, if we get rid of the water, do we get a reaction? No. Water is critical to this reaction actually occurring, so we need to include it in the equilibrium expression. Okay? So we're going to have to be careful with determining our concentration of water, the amount of water present. Okay, why is that going to be a bit of an issue? Where did we add the water? So you can go back to your procedures. Did you add water? Yeah, there you go. We added water there. Did we add water anywhere else? The titration, a good point. The titration, we do add water. We aren't going to be concerned about that volume of water. Why not? How long does it take for our reaction to get to equilibrium? Really long time. So as long as you don't take a really long time to do your titration, the amount of water you're adding during the titration is not going to affect the equilibrium. Did we add HCl? How did we add the HCl? In a solution of water. There is water coming from both the water that we directly added to our reaction, and there's also water coming from the, the acid solution that we added as our catalyst. We have to account for both sources of water. Okay. Um, so that's our water content, and that comes back to our acid catalyst messing with it. So the acid catalyst is going to complicate things because it's going to mess with our water concentration or the water amount, it's also going to mess with the amount of base that we have to add because the base is going to have to react with the strong acid first, then our weak acid. Okay? So our acid catalyst solution messes with our calculations a lot. It makes it very, very difficult or more difficult to actually determine some of these values. Okay? And we will walk through some of the calculations here in a little bit. Okay? Questions about all of that background material? All good? Accept it. So today one official responsibility is to make and standardize your base solution. Okay. I've added here partner one and with a question mark. You can split up the work. Once you make your base solution, we do not need to wait to standardize. Sorry, I'm going to cover up the microphone. We do not need to wait to standardize our base solution before we start the ester titrations. Okay. Why not? We're assuming that our ester has reached equilibrium. We don't need to wait for it to do those titrations. And the molarity just gives us an idea of how much uh, base we'd have to add, so that's not really all that important either. Okay? So if you want to, you can split it up. One partner does your standardization titrations. One partner does all the ester titrations. Okay? Break it up a little bit more than that if you want. Make it fair. Okay? So we'll go back to the microphone. To make your base solution, what we're going to do is, uh, again, measure out sodium hydroxide, and we want to make approximately a 0.7 molar solution. So what you guys all did in your pre-labs, which will get graded at the end of the semester, if it's not there, you went through the pre-lab calculation to determine how much base you need to measure out. Everybody do that. What number did you get? Roughly 14 grams. Okay. I will go through and try and set up the triple beam balances so that you can measure out exactly 14 grams on the left-hand side of the balance. If you remember from our KA lab, uh, we could count the number of pellets. I approximated a, well, we had two grams last time to being 10 pellets. If we scale that accordingly, we could also count the number of pellets, but it comes out to roughly 80 pellets, um, which is a lot to count, so it's probably easier to just use the balance. Okay. Just letting you know. Okay. Everybody do the calculation and get 14 grams. Okay, I just want to make sure I got that right. We will then go through and do our KHP solution. So you will mass out enough KHP. Yes. Oh. You will mass out enough KHP to react with 35 milliliters of the NaOH solution that you prepare. 
Okay? At least that's what the procedure calls for. Um, in the past, I've had some issues with students running out of NaOH solution before you get to the end of the experiment and finish all of your titrations. It's a bit of a problem. If you run out of base, what do you have to do? Remake your base solution. Unfortunately, you probably ran out of base partway through a titration, which means it's picking up CO2, which means that titration is dead, which means you need to remake whatever titration you started. How long did it take you to make each of those titrations? A week. Okay. So with students running out of base, we can still get through and shuffle around different base solutions. It makes the calculations pretty gnarly. I will help with that, um, but I really want to avoid at all costs, if possible, that showing up. Okay? Which is one of the reasons why I went through and did the calculations and scaled back to roughly 30 milliliters okay? instead of 35. At that amount, it's roughly 4 grams of KHP. Okay, let me repeat that. 4.0 grams. Last week we used 0 0.4. This is 10 times the amount of KHP. It is a lot of KHP. Okay? So if you come back from the balance and you have to you, you can use it with just one hand to carry the KHP, you probably did it wrong. Okay? You probably did something completely incorrect and didn't measure out the appropriate amount. Okay? So you should be measuring roughly 4 grams of KHP for each of your standardization trials, um, and that should hit you in the 25 to 30 milliliter mark for your titrations. Okay? That will give us a little bit more of a buffer on how much base you will need to finish your experiment. Okay? It's up to you. You can run exactly as the procedure says. There's no problems with that. Just make sure you record whatever mass of KHP you decide to use. Okay? Why do we not do an even smaller amount? We want at least four significant digits in our changes in volume. If our change in volume is under four digits or under a, a factor of 10, what happens? We lose accuracy in our results. Okay? So the volume that we add, we want to be greater than 10. You could scale it back even further further back you scale it, the more error you introduce into your measurement. Okay? So right around that 4 gram mark should be pretty good uh, to get you plenty of accuracy. Okay? As far as what you can do then, you can get your burettes. I would recommend everybody gets a burette, otherwise you will be spending two lab periods to do this experiment. Um, and you will titrate four trials uh, if you're doing it as partners. If you're doing it individually, you only need three trials partners, four trials. Okay? So two each partner for your standardization. You can then calculate the molarity of your NaOH. It should come out darn close to 0.7 uh, and you would officially be done for today. So something you could probably do in 30 to 45 minutes okay, if you're really on top of it. If you so desire, and this is again where I'll go ahead and cover it up. If you so desire, um, Instead of doing day two, you can have partner two go through and do the ester titrations. In theory, this will get you done with the experiment today. What's the issue with that? It goes back to the equilibrium. Maybe your solution hasn't reached equilibrium yet. If it hasn't reached equilibrium, you're testing it before it gets to that point, your value is going to be wrong. Okay? Just so you know. Okay. We'll leave you up to decide that. I don't have an actual result. All I've got to go off of is what you give me. So, kudos to you. So, day two. What we'll do is obtain a burette again, uh, and we'll now go through and titrate your standardized base solution against each of the six solutions. Okay. So, one, one A, two, three, four, five. Okay. Uh, you will need to transfer those solutions into an Erlenmeyer flask for the titration. Uh, that transferring process, you will probably lose some of the solution in each of those tiny little containers. How can we make sure all of that solution makes it into your flask? Rinse it with water. But now you're adding water. Doesn't that mess with the equilibrium? No, why not? 
It takes a long time to get to that equilibrium stage. As long as we aren't leaving it in the water for any extended period of time, we're okay. Okay. Um, at that point, you could then launch into the calculations, and we'll kind of go through some of that now. Uh, if you finish everything, if you finish everything today, on Monday you don't have because we're Wednesday now, right? On Monday, you don't have to be here, but you could come in and I could help you go through the calculations. I'm seeing a lot of kind of dead, tired faces right now. Just wait till we go through the calculations, okay? It's a lot of keeping track of things, okay? So I would recommend that when you get your numbers, you do kind of sit down with me and we go through and do those calculations, okay? Make sure that you aren't missing anything. Um, yeah. Any questions about what you're expected to do today? Yes? When we add the, uh, the bottles into the urban water class, do we add it in the same one that has the KHP in it? Uh, we don't want the KHP there anymore. Okay. Between each of your titrations, you'll remove the KHP. You always start with an empty urban water class. Um, there is something in the procedure saying adding multiple drops of phenolphthalein or adding it at multiple times. All you need is one addition of phenolphthalein. You don't need to do it multiple times. It's not going to matter. Um, oh, here's some stuff I do remember now, which might be relevant. Um, for the day two section of it, a couple things that are important to remember. We are still doing an acid-based titration, which means we still need the phenolphthalein. Okay, so don't forget it. It really sucks to remember it after you've passed the equivalence point. Right? Because then the whole solution turns pink and you have no idea what your data is supposed to mean. So make sure you get the phenolphthalein in there um, before you start your titration. The next big issue, trials two, three, and four might take 50 plus milliliters. Interesting. How does that work? Our burettes only go to 50 milliliters. You have to add more. So you'll have two finals and initial volumes, and you'll have to add those values up to get the total volume. Two and three absolutely will exceed 50 milliliters. Okay? We're looking at probably 60 and 75 milliliters for each of those. As a rough guess, it looks like as you move from two, three, four, five, it drops 10 milliliters each time, roughly. Okay? A lot of that is dependent on the concentration of the base that you actually made. Okay? So you have to be a little bit aware of that. So make sure you're careful when you record that. Next big issue to address, this is always fun with the burettes. When do you stop adding stuff in? Okay, when you hit the slight pink, but let's say you go all the way through and you need, realize you need to fill the burette again. How much liquid is in the burette before you transition? So if this is your burette, I know I'm a really good artist, don't make fun of me too much. Here's our little valvey thing at the bottom. Here's our solution, dropping in volume. When do we stop? At that 50. The bottom of the meniscus hits that 50 line, you can then fill it. Do not drop below the 50. Why not? Can't measure the volume anymore. Okay? Just to clarify that. Okay? Um, one more thing with the burettes, which I'm definitely going to pause this because calculations. Okay? Or at least the setup on it. Um, I don't blame you if you wanna, don't want to get super careful with writing down all your observations on this because it's not going to be super easy to deal with, particularly without numbers. Okay. So with the calculation section, the very first thing I would expect to see within the calculation section is table number one. That should list off your trials and your determined molarities for each of your standardization trials. Okay. That's all I would expect to see there, trial and molarity, and then average and its molarity. Okay. If you want to add as an extra thing the volumes of base added and the amount of KHP added, uh, in each of those titrations, that's fine. 
Um, but at this point, you guys have standardized solutions enough that I'll kind of trust your calculations or trust uh, your numbers relatively that I won't worry too much about seeing uh, all of that extra information. Okay? I do expect one calculation showing how you got a molarity, so give me a sample calculation for determining the molarity. Okay? If that calculation's wrong, then I can go back and assume everything else is wrong. But I would like to run under the assumption that you're doing everything right. Okay? At that point, we could then move into table number two. Table number two is going to give me all the equilibrium concentrations for each of your important trials. Those trials would be two, three, four, and five. Okay? We don't care about one and one A showing up in these results. Okay? Followed with one extra column being the equilibrium constant that you determine from each of those trials. Okay? Questions about that? Kind of straightforward, hopefully. The next part of this is going to be calculations, uh, which will involve an ice table or an ice chart. You don't need to give me a, a table title for the ice table. Um, you can just say it's part of your calculations and not worry about that. Okay? The calculations that I expect to see are for trial 5. Okay? I picked trial 5 because trial 5 has the most difficult calculations. Everything else is getting progressively easier as far as what things you need to include to get your overall results. Make sense? Okay, so trial five, what are we looking at? Well, first off, what we're gonna do is look at an ice table. So we've got an ice table that I borrowed from the lab procedure. Uh, what I, in fact, I would accept just seeing this copied and pasted into your calculations. Okay, I do wanna see an ice table you can either give it to me with the general variables in it, these A, B, C's, and X's, or you can give me the exact numbers that you calculated for your trial five. Okay? So, what are we going to try and do? So, to determine the, our equilibrium constant, we need to know the equilibrium concentrations, which are given in this bottom section of our ice table. To get those values, we need to know what A, B, C, excuse me, and X are. Okay? So how do we determine all of those? That's where the calculations get fun. We know some information to start with. We've got initial volumes for a whole bunch of different species, so we're going to have to refer back to those as we go through and do this. Okay? So I'm going to start off with, see if I can color code better than I did yesterday. We will start with determining the easier ones. Our ester concentration happens to be one of the easier values to calculate. Um, actually, before we even do that, you'll notice in the upper left-hand corner of the table, what does it say the units are? Moles. What units go into an ice table? Molarity. Why moles, then? What's that? Nope, it's not technically a barn. This is still an ice chart. It is absolutely still an ice chart. Why are we using moles and not molarity? Every other problem that you've had to go through in lecture, you had, well, I think every other problem, you had to use molarity. What would the equilibrium constant for this be? So it's K equals concentration of the acid divided by, or times the concentration of our alcohol divided by the concentration of our ester times concentration of our water, right? Let's say our volume was one liter, or let's not do one liter, let's do two liters. So we would take our mole value for our acid and divide by our total volume, which was, just said, two liters. So let's go ahead and say that value is there. We'll take our acid moles and we'll divide by two. Let's take our alcohol moles and divide by two. Let's take our ester moles divide by 2. Our water moles divide by 2. What happens? They all cancel out. Okay? We don't have to use molarity only because the volume cancels out of the calculation. Does that make sense? If you would like to push your calculations to be more correct or matching with what we've done in lecture, 
you can convert everything into molarity. I will show you that extra step on what you need to do to get it into molarity. It is completely unnecessary. When you go through to calculate the equilibrium constant, it will cancel itself out, and you don't have to worry about it. Because all of those species are in the exact same solution, they all have the same volume. Does that make sense? Okay. So, with that clarified, now we'll go back to our ester. I like blue. Let's start with blue. To get our moles of ester. So first off, what symbol would be a good symbol to use for our moles of ester? How about A? Matches in the table, right? So let's start it off with A is our moles of ester. What do we know about our ester? It is a reactant, and I heard another option. What was the other one? We know a volume. So there, while it's a reactant, that doesn't give us anything useful for a calculation. Okay. The volume gives us an idea for an amount. Well, moles are a measure of an amount, so we could use the volume. What was the volume? Two milliliters. Okay. Do we have a way to convert milliliters into moles? If we had a molarity, we could do that, but don't have a molarity. So, what information do we have about our ester? What information did you write down off of the burette about the, the ester? What was that? We know the molecular weight. Awesome. Molecular weight relates grams to moles. We have milliliters. So, not bad. We do have that information, but that doesn't help us. Let's try again. The other one we've got is the density. So what we can do is take our volume of our ester, and what we're going to do is convert it into grams of the ester. That value is the density that you got off of the burette. Okay? So that's cool. We're now at grams but we want moles. How do we convert to moles? What's the relationship between grams and moles? Molecular weight. Do we know the molecular weight? Yes. Yep, because you got that off of the bottle. Good job. And we go back to our bottle color. We can get our molecular weight. Okay. If we go through this calculation, what do we now have? Our moles. If we wanted to convert it into um, molarity, what would we need to do? Divide by our total volume, which is the same as multiplying by 1 over our total volume, which happens to be equal to, I believe, 1 over 10 milliliters. We'd have to convert our milliliters across. Whoops. 1,000 milliliters in 1 liter. And we now have our molarity. Okay, so we would do that extra step in red if we wanted to get to molarity. Where are our end units that we wanted? Because I'm wondering if we can... A is... So... Well... What do you mean convert into convert into moles from millimoles? Well, milliliters, yeah. milliliters, grams, grams. What units are we in? We're in moles. Okay. I will mention the issue with millimoles. Okay. I personally think it's a useless calculation, and I hate that people go through and use it. Okay. It's not bad necessarily. It's just an extra step that someone is bound to mess up. Okay. Why would we convert into millimoles? Someone have a calculator handy to calculate this number? Go ahead. 
So it's two, oh, I, need, I don't know the densities. Two times, let's say, 0.9 divided by 140. 0 0.0128. Oh my god, there's a zero in there. Oh, that's so awful. I can't deal with that, so I'm going to multiply by 1,000. Now I'm in millimoles. Now I don't have a one there, or I don't have that zero. That's all we're doing by converting into millimoles. That's it. Just because someone didn't like seeing a decimal point. Okay? If you don't like decimal points, that's fine. Convert into millimoles. Okay? The lab procedure likes to convert to millimoles because then they have this extra thing there. In my opinion, all that does is you end up messing up the conversion at some later stage and you get the wrong answer. Okay? Pick a unit that you want to use. If you like millimoles, stick with millimoles. You will have to convert this mole value into millimoles. How do we convert to millimoles? We'll add this as an extra red conversion because I don't like it. Red is bad, right? has to be said that way too. You have to be bad. What's the relationship between a mole and a millimole? There are a thousand millimoles in one mole, just like liter and milliliter. So if you want to do that millimole conversion, I'm cool with that. Your numbers look nicer. It ultimately usually results in messed up calculations. Okay? So, we now have the moles of ester. We know A. Cool. We are now, what, one, two, three, quarter of the way there. Which is a lie. We're actually more like an eighth of the way there. Because you got four of these trials to do. Okay? So now what do we do? Pick another value to solve. What value do you want to solve for now? You want to solve for the alcohol. Good job. Well, I'll show you why you want to solve for the alcohol. We go through and take a look at the alcohol. Moles of alcohol. What do we know about our alcohol? Yes, that's a conversion factor. We'd have to have something to convert, though. Molecular weight is a conversion factor. Also helpful, but we need to still have something to convert. Our volume. Our volume of our alcohol was one milliliter. We can now then bring in our density, again off of our bottle. Bring in our molecular weight. I do that backwards? Yeah. How do I do that backwards? Oh, that's how I did it backwards. I started it backwards from the get-go. brings up an interesting point. How easy was it to see that I did that backwards? That was pretty easy. Why was it easy? Because you could see it. If you do it in your head, you can't see it. So when you do your calculations, please write them out. Um, let's make sure I don't screw it up again. Milliliters, grams, particularly after yelling about it. We get our density. Where's our density coming from? Which bottle? The alcohol bottle. Make sure you get them correct. Where do we get the molecular weight from? Again, from our bottle. And we now have a mole value. If you want to go through and convert to molarity, you could go through and do all that molarity jazz that we did above. If you want to convert to millimoles, you can do all that millimole jazz as well. Okay? What's the relationship between the types of calculations we just did here, between C and A? That's the mole relationship between them. But if we look at the calculation itself, what's different about the calculation? Change the densities and the molecular weights, but the format is the same. We end up... I can't put that there. We end up multiplying by the density, dividing by the molecular weight every single time for both our alcohol and the ester. So that's kind of nice. Okay? We're just repeating that same type of calculation. Not too bad. Okay? So let's take a stab at another one. Let's take a look at the water. OK? 
Okay, so water will make. Uh, I'm gonna have to delete anything, everything anyway. We'll do our water in orange. So we added water, right? So if we wanted to figure out our moles of water, what do you think we could go through and do? Same thing. Same thing. That's pretty nice. We could go through and say we take our volume of water, which for trial five is two milliliters. Multiply by the density. What's the density of water? Divide by the density of water, I mean. Are you kidding me? Fickle. Yeah, exactly right. That does actually work. Let's see if I can do it correct this time. Milliliters, grams, one. Thank you for catching that, by the way. And then we want to bring in our molecular weight. I'm getting this one right, at least. And we now have our moles of water. We could go through again if we wanted to determine uh, molarity or uh, millimoles, if you wanted to do that conversion. Okay. One extra problem with this. Is that your final answer? Why not? We also have water coming from the HCl. We have to account for that water addition as well. Okay? So this was our direct addition of water. We also need to account for an indirect. Okay? And this is where our calculation gets um, a bit gnarly. So how do we get our indirect moles of water? Okay, that's ultimately coming from our HCl solution. Well, if we take a look at an HCl solution, we know it's three moles, so we just subtract three moles from the total moles in the solution, right? Yeah, that doesn't really work. Is there a relationship that we could put into it? What's the balanced equation, though? Yeah, we don't really have an equation that relates water and acid nicely for us. So that would tell us the relationship between H plus and HCl. We want water, but water still doesn't show up in that. So you got a good idea. You're going back to balanced equations. Unfortunately, we're going to have to go with something else. It's not moles. Or molarity. Molarity still involves moles. Nope. Weight. What can you tell me about the weight? The weight of the HCl solution. That's fair enough. The weight of the HCl solution. What made up the mass of that solution? Water and HCl that was present. If we can determine the mass of the HCl in the solution, we can subtract that from our total mass to get us the mass of the water in the solution. Okay? So now what we've got to do is work through a calculation that can allow us to determine all of that. Okay? So how would we go through and do that? We know mass of the solution equals the mass of H2O and the mass of HCl. Okay, we do know the mass of the solution. That was kind of nice. Okay. What's that? Okay, so our mass of our water, that's an eraser, the mass of our water will equal the mass of the solution minus the mass of our HCl. Was the mass of your solution the same in all trials, or in your trial 1 and 1A? No, okay? Which is why we did two of them. So what we could do is determine the mass of the HCl solution by using density, okay? So the mass of our solution is going to come from the volume of the solution, 
Is it the same for all of them? It's all five mils, right? So it'll be our volume of our HCl solution times the density of the solution. Okay. This value was something that you calculated from trials 1 and 1A. One that gives us the mass of the solution. In theory, what would we expect the density to be? Equal to 1, less than 1, greater than 1. Why should it be more than 1? We added mass to it, the HCl. We would expect the density to be greater than because there's an extra mass coming from our HCl solution. And we would assume the amount of HCl we add does not affect the volume. Okay? How do we get the mass of HCl? Calculate it, fair enough. How do you calculate it? It's difficult to use the density for our mass of HCl. That's not going to work out so well for us. We can use the molarity to give us the moles. So within an individual solution, we know we have 5 milliliters of our HCl solution. And that HCl solution we know that in one liter there is approximately three moles. How do we know that value? Where did you get the molarity from? Nope. Trials one and two, when you titrate in, you're going to also determine the molarity based on trials one and two. Sorry, one and one A. Okay. Yet another calculation I'm not showing you how to do. Hoping you can figure that one out. Okay. That gets us pretty close to the moles. The issue is that we would be missing our unit issue or our units, so we can fix that. Milliliters, liters. Okay, so now we've got moles, but I want mass. How do we get mass? Is there a relationship between moles and mass? Heard it, the molar mass. Make sure I put it in there correctly. Moles. How do we know the molar mass? Periodic table. Periodic table. We look at the molar mass of hydrogen and the molar mass of chlorine, add them up. I believe it's 36.45. And we can now go through and do that. We now know the mass of HCl contributed to the solution. Yes? <coughs> you measured it for trial 1 and 1A. You did not, well, maybe you measured it for all of them. Did you measure it for all of them? No. Okay. So let's go back to trial 1 and 1A. Did you get the exact same mass? Yeah. And if you didn't get the exact same mass, that's why we're trying to determine that density so that we can get a more appropriate value there. Okay. If the density value you get is less than 1, you need to talk to me. Because you will not be able to do the calculations right if it's less than 1. Okay. Questions about determining this. What did that then give you? That just gave you the mass of the water coming from the acid. How do we get the moles of water coming from the acid? Our mole from our indirect water is our moles of H2O will equal the mass of H2O divided by the molecular weight for water, and we now know our moles. Fun, right? Okay. That gets us B. So we've now got A, B, and C almost there, home stretch. I'm going to kind of push through the calculations for x pretty fast. I'm going to need pretty much the full page again to get our x value. Uh, what color have I not done yet? How about pink? Everybody loves pink, right? Does pink show up okay? Yeah, it looks pretty good. So let's do pink to solve for x. 
What is x? H nope. The moles of the carboxylic acid. Okay, how are we going to determine that? What did the carboxylic acid react with? The base. So what we can do is determine the moles of NaOH added, and we know, because we're going to the titration point, the moles of NaOH added will be equal to the moles of acid. Moles of which acid? Not KHP. We're doing the ester titration now, so there's no KHP there. The moles of the HCl and the moles of the carboxylic acid. And I'm just going to call it CA in an attempt to abbreviate that. Okay? So to get the moles of our carboxylic acid, that's going to be the moles of NaOH minus the moles of HCl. How do we figure out the moles of NaOH? What do we know about the NaOH? We know the molarity and, a couple people said it, the volume where? I think kind of. Titration is what I was looking for, which you may have said. Um, we're looking, we look at the volume of that that we actually titrated in. Okay? So from our experiment, the titrated volume milliliters of our NaOH. Where's my pink? Times our molarity, which should be darn close to 0 0.7 moles per liter. We have to make sure we deal with our unit conversion. 1 liter, 1,000 milliliters. We now have the moles of NaOH titrated. I think I can sink it in there. We now have to subtract our moles of HCl. What do we know about our HCl? What's that? We know the same thing. We know how much HCl we added, which in this case was 5 milliliters. We had 5 milliliters of our HCl solution times the molarity. Where do we get the molarity from? Trial 1 and 1A. One um, make sure we deal with our correct unit conversion. 1 liter, 1,000 milliliters. And assuming I did that all right, looks good. We now have the moles of the carboxylic acid, or X. We now know A, B, C, and X. What do we do? Plug it back up into our ice chart expression to solve for our equilibrium concentrations. Once we know our equilibrium concentrations, K equals C plus X, excuse me, times X divided by A minus X, B minus X. And we now have the equilibrium con ca concentration. Congratulations, you have now done one quarter of your calculations. Repeat for trials two, three, and four. Okay. Some of the other calculations are easier. Why? We don't add some of the other species in it. So I believe for trials 2, 3, and 4, there's no alcohol, which means there's no C value to calculate. Okay? Not that the C value is all that difficult to calculate anyway, but it's not there. Okay? Yeah, for those of you really upset and depressed by that, sorry, but that's the way these calculations work. You can try and set it up in Excel. You'll notice there was a lot of repetition uh, when trying to determine all of those things. Um, I just think that you'd have to be very, very careful with how you labeled things so that you could do your cell references appropriately to make sure you get the calculations to come out correct. 
What I would recommend is do it by hand, a sheet of paper per um, experiment, two, three, four, and five. A single sheet, front and back, whatever calculations you got to repeat, you can repeat them. That way when you get to the end and you get the equilibrium constant, and if they're all different, drastically different, then we can sit down and go through your calculations line by line and figure out what went wrong. If you skip any of the steps that we went through here and something goes wrong, you get to go through and redo every single calculation. Write it down. It will make your life easier, I promise, and mine. Because okay, then I don't have to troubleshoot what you did in your head. I don't care if the calculations show up in your notebook at all. Okay, that 